in Gen Z's. And actually for my presentation, what I did was to just get about seven of them together and tell them you know, that this was what I was going to talk about and what would they want me to present. So I'm actually standing here presenting on their behalf. <laughs> Absolutely. So youth representative <laughs> for, for the day. So that, that's what I did. The second one also around this was to look and learn. Typically when you go into a meeting, different people are coming with different backgrounds, different experiences, and we need to be able to create, you know, the environment where we listen even to different viewpoints, you know, and, and this is necessary because you don't have to imagine that only your viewpoint is the right one. You know, you should be open to new information. I mean, having been here for just a couple of hours, I've learned a lot personally, you know, and there are things I'm going to do differently. You know, even though I came here to speak, I've also learned, and that's the, what I expect that all of us will do going forward. And whenever you have this kind of forum, you have to also, as the leader of that forum, be able to lead and also engage the team so that you nurture some relationships. You cannot be discussing important topics and the people are not comfortable with one another. You know, so if you're going to have a systems leadership, there's a need to engage and also to energize. And then you have to be accountable. You know, stakeholders must demonstrate results. I think one of my colleagues or panelists spoke about, you know, buying the laptops before we figure out what we are going to do with them. That is a no-no. You know, we should be accountable both at individual and also as a collective in our various countries and also in the nation. And then finally is to review and revise. You know, it's an ever-evolving process. So you have a meeting, you discuss the ideas with the you know, um, inclusive stakeholders, and when you're done next time, you apply those learnings to strengthen the approach so you have a better um, outcome subsequently. So in summary, my first point is system leadership, and what it really does is it eliminates the concept of silo problem solving, and it actually embraces a more collaborative problem solving technique through collective leadership. You know, and I recommend highly the governments and leaders in African countries, we must implement these initiatives, not just when you are working, but starting from schools, the workplace, the community, so that together, you know, um, we can harness a very collaborative problem-solving mentality for the African youth, especially in their formative years. And I think a number of my panelists have said the same thing. The second idea I wanted to share is about stimulating youth entrepreneurship. For me, this is fundamental. You know, we must match the growth in numbers, capacity and capability, you know, um, with productive businesses. And as much as jobs are important, I think even more important is empowering the energized youth I referred to earlier, you know, so that they'll be able to bring the ideas together to solve real problems that we are facing today, you know, so they can create wealth here for the, in the continent for future generations. Uh, some of the other benefits of large-scale entrepreneurship, as we all know, is to bring the youth that are already alienated or marginalized back into the economic mainstream, you know, and that is really critical. The second is the number of youth also going through either mental or, you know, socio-psychological problems and delinquency. And if we pull them in, it would give them an opportunity to also start innovating and becoming productive so that with a collective mind power is used to positively impact our society. I mean, a few, I think it was last week or the week before, I was reading BBC and I came across a very interesting article. And it's called How a Nigerian Scheme Forged in War Creates Billionaires. <laughs> And it showcases how a Nigerian entrepreneurship scheme, and I think it's pronounced Igba boy, and if you're Nigerian, forgive my accent here. It actually gives youth um, a front row seat in practical experience by understanding a well-entrenched entrepreneur, like a Dangote or let's say an NSK missed in Ghana. You know, so I think one of you spoke about apprenticeship, and this is a practical way of getting that done. So it's not just um, meeting for a short period, but that person stays with them, you know, they learn from them, and then at the end of that training program, it could be a year, it could be two, it could be three, instead of being paid, you know, the person, the ogre in this case, sets you up 
So the apprentice leaves with, let's say if you, in, you did this with an NS chemist, you finish and he sets up a small pharmacy for you. you know? So it's not just you learn the skills, but you actually are going straight to applying it and you can also now start multiplying that, that effect. I understand this has been so successful that um, Strive Masiwa, the Zimbabwean billionaire who has just been named, I think it was just on Sunday, as Britain's first black billionaire, actually has also used this in his company. And since he's a billionaire, I think it's something we should all listen to and try and multiply in our, our various countries. Last week or two weeks ago, I also um, heard the Director General of African Development Bank, Akinwumi Adesina, actually proposing the establishment of what he called youth entrepreneurship investment banks in every African country so that it, they could support young entrepreneurs. You know, um, I'm sure you'll be thinking, why wouldn't the banks just do that? But that's a different conversation. <laughs> you know, and in Ghana, the setup of the Development Bank of Ghana you know, would actually allow the private sector and, of course, the youth to be able to gain access to not just short-term capital, which they have today, but to the medium and long-term capital at affordable rates through their banks. You know, so I think that initiative from the government would also help us a lot. So let me just move quickly to my third one. And I think uh, almost every panelist has spoken about that. For me, my third idea was about specific or other interventions in specific sectors of the economy. And I just chose two, you know, agriculture, which I'm sure all of us appear to love, and technology. Uh, structurally, we know that the world will have to find more innovative ways of feeding itself. I actually like how you positioned it around, you know, the song Feed the World, and 40 years down, we haven't arrived, you know. But the, the reality is, Africa still has um, the largest arable land, about 60% in this world. And this is a significant strategic advantage, which we must use to promote economies of scale, so that we can actually leverage this, you know, vital asset and obtain a competitive advantage you know, um, across um, uh, our continent, and I think agri is important in almost every nation. We have to change the perceptions and get the next generation to see agriculture as the next cash cow, not least because I have family members, including my husband, who is a farmer. But also in 2018, I think there was a youth employment summit in agriculture in Kigali, and a young lady stood up and challenged how agriculture is being promoted and advocated to attract the youth. You know, and she said, and I'm going to use her words for part of it, she said agriculture must be advertised as a sexy occupation. Mm -hmm. I see that my team wrote attractive, you know, because sexy probably didn't sound <laughs> right professionally. <laughs> you know, exactly. You know, and what she was saying is that currently if you go online, and I think for our viewers, after this, you can check. If you either Google or do a search on agriculture or Ministry of Agriculture in your nation, you're not going to find young people, energetic people, people that are like, oh, I want to be like this person. I mean, when I did the search myself, I saw a lot of the people, I mean, with no disrespect, looked more elderly, you know, whether you're going on pension, you're looking for something to do thereafter. But it's actually something that should can dramatically change you know, the, the economic fate of our nations, and so it should be promoted. And she went on to say that stakeholders should literally promote agriculture as the oxygen, you know, um, of African economies, and not just the backbone. Because without the backbone, you can live. Without oxygen, we've all seen how COVID has made oxygen so important. Without oxygen, you cannot live. And so that is what I'd like um, us to see. And then um, I think... My just second point around this is that the governments across our nations also must ensure that there are modern policies, you know, that, or rather policies that embrace modern farming practices. And I think that has been discussed severally. You know, basic things that making sure that if the youth are now going into agriculture, as an example, you know, there's land title, you know, sorted out, logistics is not a problem, you know, um, and they can also add value to the produce. And this is where my, the second point I spoke about on the entrepreneurship comes in. We have to be able to create a culture to support these entrepreneurs, you know, so that Africa will now be a place where the uncountable number 
of successful entrepreneurs. I don't know how many people online know Nish Koko, a very successful you know, um, manufacturer or processor in the cocoa industry. And we need to multiply these. So a, a second point around here is technology and digitization. I think that has also been spoken about severally. But I need to make the point that we all know that on the continent, Kenya is praised for, you know, um, its tech entrepreneurs. And perhaps some of us should also adopt, um, if not all of us, their best practice. But the continent needs to be a future hub of global growth not just pockets of, you know, um, hubs and growth of techpreneurs, because we understand fully that technology and digital solutions do not only create convenience, but it also enhances the customer experience, regardless of the industry one is in, you know. So when we are trying to name success stories in Africa on technology, you know, we should have an unending list and not just the two that I have here, who are Sasha and Tunde, who are the founders of Jumia, which I'm sure everybody listening online or is mindful of. And over the last 50 years, I think Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, as we know, I mean, we are the number first and second in, in cocoa. But recently, I think we've all seen the news where China has just used technology to increase you know, um, the, the production and productivity of cocoa. So, we, we, we have to be able to transition from just doing things manually to adopting the right technology so that we can see an expansion you know, and multiplication and exponential growth in what we do. My fourth point, I think, has also been spoken about a lot, and it's about education and the future skills of work. And I think Kwame did an excellent job of simplifying that. It's often a very emotive area. And I just remembered when I, in my previous job, you know, your dad actually once wrote, um, he was chairman, and he wrote an article in the papers, and he said that he, he isn't sure, or rather, based on his, um, the interviews he had conducted in recent years, a lot of the people that were coming out of our universities, you know, did not, were not ready for work. I don't know if you remember that article. I mean, it was in the media forever, you know. So it's often an emotive area because we can all relate to it. And it's pivotal yeah, for us to be able to um, grow or rather um, improve you know, um, Africa. The current system of education, I think that has been spoken about a lot, where children enter primary school, you have to go to secondary school, tertiary, if you are lucky or blessed, I think it's outdated, honestly. It's not for everybody. And it doesn't pass down the practical experience so many of our more mature population um, have or what is required for the, work, the world of work. I mean, recently I came across the Khan Academy as an example. It's an online platform where you can learn anything, anything, I mean, from art to zoology, you know, and anything in between. Imagine that we had this kind of tool, not in English, but in a local modified for language and for context, you know, and imagine that the telecos would also be so kind to grant everybody in you know, one of those, the public schools, whether it's Jamestown, primary, or wherever, access to download you know, um, information at night. So that even if you are not in a formal institution where you are learning how to think critically or solve problems, you have the opportunity you know, to do this on your own. Consider an exam. That actually meant instead of repeating something you learned in class, and you just have to be able to you know, put it in memory and then bring it out, imagine that the exam was now to solve a set of everyday problems. I think the focus here is on applied ideas and approaches so that education will have a real impact. You know, and when people have to transition from the world of school to the world of work, it will be very easy. So for me, workplace skills I think should not be overlooked, you know, when educating our young. This is the how of the workplace. That is why sometimes you find somebody who had a first class degree, who has applied to over 100 institutions and has been fortunate to get two interviews and didn't get the job. And then you have somebody else who had the third class, who applied to two, and then they get the job. And you're thinking, ah, I've not got the job. I mean, she wasn't exactly great at school because there are a whole set of skills that the other first class you know, um, candidate did not have. So our 
current educational structures, I propose, should emphasize this aspect of learning, you know, and it shouldn't be too late in the cycle. I think it should be very early, you know, right from infancy, and I think a number of my colleagues have already mentioned that. And so to complete all of this, I have my fifth and final point, and I think Charlotte did a great job of that, and it's about putting in place, you know, appropriate policy, administering it well, and also having a regulatory framework, you know, to support that. And I don't want to overplay this because there's so much that has already been said, you know. Um, but currently, you can see that it takes weeks, months, sometimes years, to set up a business, to register a business, you know. And then you can see that sometimes you have entrepreneurs who, because they probably do not understand the whole idea of taxation, you know, would sometimes try and not reflect, you know, things as they ought to be. And this is where I think we need support. So first, we need to be able to streamline the business registration processes, procedures, and also to lower the cost. Imagine, you know, um, Abna is 22, trying to start up a business, you know, I, I can't pay so much to, 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 to do that. So we have to register, um, we have to lower the cost, especially for the youth. And then secondly, we have to support by providing information and obviously counseling and then assistance to regulatory issues. I think we shouldn't assume that once you, you know, you read stuff, you understand. Because even as chief executive, when I read things, sometimes I call people to explain to me. You know, so the youth need that support. And then we must provide supportive taxation regulations and, of course, taxation rates that are simpler, you know, and so they can also um, be instrumental in this process. And finally, for me, is to ensure the rule of law. You know, this particular idea for me operates pretty much like education because it's a multiplier to all the other ones that I spoke about. And these are really helpful to get ourselves as individuals, as communities, as nations, as a continent, to address the challenge coming in the next generation. So in closing, let me offer a word of hope and reflection. You know, for me, it is in addressing our biggest challenges that we forge the bonds, solve the problems, and chart the journey to a shared future together. When I think about our youth, the millions of minds today who are solving everyday challenges just to stay alive, not to thrive, they should be rather thinking of how to progress and tap into the wealth you know, that we see in our nations. There is actually no doubt at all that Africa is rising. We have the chance to make sure it rises to be something that all of us can be proud of for the generations to come. We might have failed them, but I think the good thing is talking about it is a start. What is required is action. And collectively, not just us, but in the next forum, there will be younger people as well, and together we can deliberate on these issues. And hopefully, as some of the panelists have said already, you know, it doesn't end with a talk. You know, we actually would expect that Ishmael Yamsin and Associates would actually take some of these ideas, share it with you know, um, the right bodies in the various um, governments, and then we can move this forward. So thank you so much for your time, and I hope I've given you something to think about and inspired you yourself to deliver a message of hope, not a message of everything is broken in Africa, you know, because especially if we come together collectively, we will be amazed at the Africa we'll be seeing over the next decade. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, Abina is the Chief Executive Officer of APSA Bank. And I've already told you she's led the transition from Barclays Bank uh, previously now to APSA Bank. And I hope that I'm going to open an account there uh, because it's an African bank now. That's the case. Previously, I would think that it's a bank from England, and so when I put in my money, it, it would look very small. The cities are against the pound, but now CD are against CD or CFA or other, other currencies. So, yes, I, I think I'm allowed to open uh, 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 an account at any branch in Absa. They're also doing very well. Please, another round of applause for 
have been asked. Thank you very much uh, for this very insightful presentation. And so the questions would start uh, flowing almost immediately. But I have um, Mami De here also on the line. And I told you earlier on that um, she's going to give us a brief commentary on all the things that we have said here before we begin our question and answers. Um, after her, we'll pick a quick break and come back into the questions. We are very much marking the time and want to be on schedule. So, Mami, if you are ready, let's uh, listen to you now. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure you've been following and monitoring the discussions. Uh, let's hear you. Thank you very much, um, and happy belated Africa Day. Thank you very much to Ishmael Yamsen and Associates for this amazing opportunity to share my remarks. My name is Mamed Dehir, and I am a policy analyst with the Government of Canada, specifically with the Public Health Agency of Canada, and I am also a founder of a not-for-profit organization called the Power of Love Foundation Canada. Now today I'll be sharing a few remarks on the influence of education, policy reforms, and the need to implement grassroots initiatives. The renowned speakers have superbly summarized some of the austere gaps within the continent of Africa. Notwithstanding, I will share my transient remarks on the place of education as described by Madam Sheila. Indubitably, education plays a significant and influential role in our society. And in the field of public health, education is considered as a social determinant of health. And this goes to imply that if an individual or population receives quality education, especially at the local or basic level, like Mother Sheila emphasized, this will unequivocally and positively impact their overall health outcome, especially on an individual and population level. Now, evidence-based research demonstrates that there is a lack of diversity in the field of STEM, especially when it comes to Blacks and Africans occupying um, positions in the STEM field. Subsequently, this shows that there's a prevalent gap within this industry. Therefore, it is expedient for students at the basic level to receive training in this field, which will be salutary to their overall development, um, especially as youth. In recent times, the, the phrase STEM has been sort of rebranded into STEAM, or um, with the inclusion of an extra A and another M, whereby the A signifies art and the M signifies medicine. Hence, there are other ways and means that the creation of, of or enforcing and developing people in the field of STEM could be utilized. One could be with the use of youth-focused initiatives, such as mentorship programs and so on. And I was very excited to hear that Mr. Kwamina Asimini um, had mentioned that Stantic Bank was actually um, using an intervention, which was a Stantic Bank intervention that was tailored to mentor youth um, towards nation building. Now, in terms of policy reforms, being a policy analyst myself, I do acknowledge that when implementing and making amendments to policies, it could be very strenuous and it's not as easy as it's portrayed. However, if government leaders, policymakers, state sanctioned institutions, and organizations are able to reform and create effective long-term policies and programs that are youth-tailored and youth-focused, this indeed can contribute to overall development. Therefore, I want to conclude by saying that as a global village, we are all striving towards the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Now, and within these goals, in the goal number seven, it's aiming towards strong and quality education, which is to ensure inclusivity and quality education that would in turn promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Therefore, it is effective to incorporate STEM or STEAM that has been rebranded into our basic education and also to enforce effective policies and ensure that there is a policy reforming either in state sanctioned institutions or organizations. I would like to conclude with a phrase um, from South Africa, which is a very popular South African phrase, which is Ubuntu. I am because we are. We can all contribute to the development of Africa in our little ways, and I believe that this will make the African continent a better place. Africa depends on us, 
Africa depends on you and I. Thank you once again to Ishmael Yamsin and Associate for this amazing opportunity to share my remarks. My name is Mami Gahir. Over to you. Right, so thank you very much. Oh, of course, we can appreciate Mami for that um, brief, but of course, the very detailed um, presentation as well, or commentary on all of the things that we have said here so far. And so if you have your question, kindly prepare yourself that after this very quick break, you will give it to us. We will not be able to pick too many questions. So if you can type it as well, kindly do us the honors so that we are able to put all of them together. Even when we have left here, we will still forward the questions to our panel members um, because from here we continue the discussion and we continue uh, to follow through on how we can get the youth to take charge of tomorrow. This is Business Roundtable 2021. We'll be right back. I'm Opal. I have to go deposit some money at the bank and buy some things at the mall. Okay, oh. but deposit money at this time. Which bank is still open? Oh, Akusia. With a Stambik ATM, even without your debit card, you can deposit money at the ATM. You know the ATM doesn't close. It is 24-7. Oh, wow. That's good, oh. You know, as for me, when I close it, I have to carry the money on me home. With all the rest, and sometimes even when I'm asleep and I hear mosquitoes making noise in my ears, I have to wake up and check if their money is still there. <laughs> oh, Akusia, don't make me laugh. I'm serious, Daddy. It's not easy for me at all. Me, Kebu. Hey, Beje, no Kobe view. I'm off to the mall now. Welcome back. So we are still live on Metro TV and on DSTV channel 277. We are live on our Facebook page, Ishmael Yamsen and Associates. So you can get on there and put up your uh, questions if you have been monitoring. And then we are live on Zoom and on YouTube as well. Um, I understand also that we are live, live uh, on Original TV. I'm currently hearing that, live on Original TV. So you can tune in to Original TV as well. And so I'll now come back into the studio, but instead of asking my very own questions, we don't have a lot of time now, I'll go straight to Zoom to listen to the questions and the contributions. As I'm told, we have people standing by there to give us questions there, and then if we have maybe one or two minutes, we will put up our own to them. So um, can we have the very first person kindly mention your name, where you are watching us from, because we know there are other people watching us outside. Um, Ghana and even Africa, and then put up your question. Right, so whilst we prepare for people who are standing by on Zoom, we have uh, quite a number of questions that have come in from those who have typed this. Um, we'll try as much as possible to read some of them, but I will begin with the two bankers and when we can come to Naptex, uh, former chief executive of Naptex. You, meant, you spoke about the development bank, which is a good initiative. Uh, the things that they are supposed to do, he spoke about 
uh, vocational training and the fact that we need to invest more in that sector and then in agri as well. Why are we not doing that yet? And I'll come and put the same question to you. Thank you, Akwesi. I think to say we are not doing it at all will not be accurate. But we are not doing it you know, at the scale that is required. You know, so a number of banks, including APSA, we have a startup proposition and um, we also have an emerge proposition. The startup is to help youngsters who are entrepreneurs to be able to you know, um, have their businesses up and running. In addition to um, the expectations from a bank, we also give them technical support, mentoring, etc. Mm -hmm. But we are not doing enough. And I think on the large scale. On the large scale. You see, because this, if you look at all the statistics that have been shared, this needs to be something that is exponential. You know, and so that is why I think getting, as an example in Ghana, the mm. development bank coming on board, mm. where the interests would actually, or the cost of financing, you know, um, will not only be cheaper, but will be for a longer period of time. Most mm. banks, you know, um, currently lend for up to about five years, mm. and that is not enough for somebody who's starting up a business. Mm. You know, so we are doing it, but we need to do it in a much larger scale. Mm. And I think that is why the conversation is relevant. Mm. So let me come to you with the same question coming up. You, you mentioned some of the things that you're doing, but you agree, for example, a plumber, uh, if well-structured, if well-trained, if well everything done, probably supported with technology. Uh, why are we not doing that to that skill yet? So thank you very much. Hmm. I think in my comments, I did highlight the fact that you know, corporate Ghana should embrace apprenticeships as a form of corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. Thus far, most of the handouts have been monetary, financial. And it is, it is my expectation that as entrepreneurship becomes more, more, more entrenched, as entrepreneurship becomes more entrenched within our economy, mm -hmm. we will begin to have corporations, you know, involve themselves in sponsoring some of these technical um, institutions to develop skills. I think the Development Bank addresses a gap that is one of many gaps within our economy. Uh, we're all well aware that you know, the absence of patient capital is one of the biggest, uh, biggest foundational gaps that we have in our startup space. Oftentimes people wrongly think that uh, banks should be financing startups. I make the point that you know, we need to move to a construct where rather than a solo person going to a bank and trying to raise a loan, mm. you pull together resources. Cooperatives, uh, cooperatives with friends. Uh, friends Charlotte mentioned that as well. Yes, friends, family coming members together. coming together mm. and then you know, gaining a critical mass of foundational equity. And then you approach the bank for working capital. I think it's a bit of a very strong leap. If you, if, if you read you know, stories of successful entrepreneurs, both, and I use the word successful, both uh, in, in, in Ghana and elsewhere, other parts of Africa, mm. they will all have stories of how they either borrowed money from a family member mm. or they you know, sort of got mm. a grant from mm. a benefactor. I think that the bank comes into play further down the line when you have you know, a proposition that is quote unquote bankable. But at the very early stages, you know, it's, it's owner's risk. It's not bank risk. The funds we have are depositors funds. So we can't you know, risk them unduly. And so, you know, I think we've got to move from a construct where we like to go solo in Africa, you know, rather than pooling, you know, like-minded entrepreneurs together, we like to go solo. And the, and the shift that is required is that, you know, find some classmates, find some family members, you know, involve your parents, and then grow the business to a point before you go in. But just to highlight the last point on the mm. development bank, mm. it does address the patient capital, but there are other interventions that are required from a venture capital perspective, that's a lot more uh, speculative in terms of its approach. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that the development bank would be a fair step to many other interventions that will be coming through. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, Charlotte, you had wanted to ask something, oh, you're, you're okay. You're okay. But um, on that point, do we not need a national policy, an effective national policy? We have the National Youth Authority, and I want to ask you that particular question based on what the two of them have said. We have the National Youth Authority, we have the Youth Employment Agency, we have NEIP, but we need a conscious program, a conscious effort to make sure that right from the beginning of education, as we have all stated, 
the stem through to the point where they get jobs and the point where we have skills empowerment and training and all that then people are empowered do we not need a national strategic policy there is a development bank coming up as we have talked about but what what should be the case um, let me look at it from the african perspective right. because um, again we have audience that are not necessarily from ghana and i would want to say that the issue of structure of our economies mm and education, they go hand in hand. Mm. Now, if we fix education, assuming by we are able to fix education, and we don't fix the structure, mm. there will be no space for them to participate. And that in itself would be another problem. So we need to be looking at the two sides together. And many at times we forget the structural issues, which are fundamental to opening up mm. space for participation for everybody. And currently, the reason why many people would finish school and cannot find jobs, and that when you put out an advert for five people, you get 10,000 people, mm. is because the education is producing at a faster pace than the economy can absorb. Mm. So again, I would want to say we should look at that. Um, issues about the various interventions that exist are they sustainable? You know, another thing as Africans we have to be looking at when we agree on how we'll solve a problem is the cost. Now, um, interventions that solve the issue in the medium term are great because it takes pressure off the system. But whilst they are at it, we need to be using the online, credible online platforms to scale them up in certain areas that they can be effective and they can participate anywhere they go. So you don't want to see our graduates being drowned in Spain and every day is something we hear on BBC because they can't find jobs. And it's, you know, some of these things, when you don't witness them because we are quite comfortable in our luxuries, you don't know how depressing it is. Yesterday I met somebody and after a few minutes, the person calls me, oh, madam, how are you? And I'm like, I'm good. And can you help me go abroad? And I'm like, why? So I said, there's COVID and people are actually staying at home. He says, no, I want to go. If I don't go, I'll die of hunger. I would rather go and die from COVID than to stay. So that is the mindset of people who have finished school and have certificates but cannot find space. The banks are full. They are not automation. They are automating. The airports have automated where would have taken many more people now. One machine would do the work of 100. So yes, there are structural issues we have to pay attention to. And these interventions that you spoke about, youth employment, um, NACO, are great. But they are great in a very limited way. Mm -hmm. And the cost of it is such that we need to inject a bit more reskilling or retooling into the people to make it a sustainable solution going forward. Can I add a bit on the work integration? And I like that bit because of where I'm coming from, where the polytechnics are expected to work, integrate, and train. But you see, if you look at the structure again, we don't have a very vibrant manufacturing sector. In fact, the place that is big is the informal sector. And when you take people to the watch seller, for work experience, work integration, with a graduate experience, they will not go. Because in their mind, they have to go to Unilever. How many Unilevers do we have? So as we shape people's perception of what work integration should mm -hmm. be, we need to be mindful of our context and encourage them to take the experience from the watch seller with your education so that they can automate or add certain innovative solutions that are quite convenient to the growing middle class. So that is why we need education that incorporates critical thinking and problem solving and not regurgitation so people can solve the problems within our context. The capacity training. You, you, you have a point to make. Yes, that's the point you made earlier. I was actually going to make a point mm -hmm. on capacity. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I, I totally endorse the views of Sheila. But I think it's also we're beginning to treat Africa like one country. Mm -hmm. The same, the same um, challenge we have faced as Africans. We have to also appreciate that the different countries of Africa are different stages of development and so their needs are different mm. and so if for instance um, the needs of the youth in Ghana in terms of skill may not be the same as Liberia because post-conflict because of their history their challenges may be quite different and so the interventions that are structured 
should also be research-based. We see a lot of interventions in Africa, and like you say, um, it doesn't address the structure, we don't look at the sustainability, mm -hmm. but it also needs to be research-based. We are taking decisions that I'm not always sure are actually based on research, and then we get surprised when these interventions don't work. Um, there is research, and the African Capacity Building Foundation has done some fantastic work. It's actually on their website. The last one I read was on African critical technical skills. Mm -hmm. And they actually do an analysis, country by country, what the skills gap is. So if you take Ghana, for instance, how many quantity surveyors do we have in Africa? How many quantity surveyors should we have now? And how many quantity surveyors are we going to need in the next, let's say, 20 years? And they do this for a lot of the African countries, and they look at all these different skills that Africa actually needs. And they also look at the skills that Africa has in the diaspora and how we can harness all those um, capacities to mm. help in developing Africa. Mm. So if you are structuring a curriculum in a university and you don't take this into account, you would end up producing graduates that cannot find jobs. Not because we don't have jobs. We do have jobs. Right. We, there's needs. But we are what we're producing, there's a mismatch between what we're producing and what the market requires. Mm. So we really need to take a step back and be a bit more, um, use research more in, even in designing these interventions we're coming up with in Africa. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Charlotte. I'll say, unfortunately, our time is up. We scheduled ourselves to close at 1. And so we've, we've been able to go through all we had wanted to. Unfortunately, the comments from Zoom were not able to pick all, but we have quite a number of them. And let me assure you that we have noted all of them. We are going to share it around to our panelists uh, to take it along and of course would we'll create a platform as well where we will be able to answer every question that has come. I would give 30 seconds for closing remarks to Michael, 30 seconds and then we can wrap up. Well let me just say thank you very much to all the speakers. Let me say thank you once again to the many hundreds who joined us on Zoom, on the uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook, where without you it would not have been um, the success that we have seen today. Um, the points that have been raised are very important. And as the colleagues have said, we will capture these and um, work with them and find ways to make them actionable thoughts. Um, and um, also, uh, because of all the conversations, we will look at uh, having a repeat of this, but for the youth and with the youth, right. and, and, and not with young people like me. <laughs> right, so, so thank, thank you, you very, very much, much, Michael. Thank you very much, Abina. Thank you very much, Abina, as well. Thank you very much, Sheila. Sheila. Thank you very much, Kwamena. And then thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. My name is Kwesi Efri. Of course, I work with Metro TV. I was your MC or host for the day. Have a very good afternoon. TV, insightful and inspiring moments. Ghana is a beautiful country. There is so much of it you probably haven't seen, haven't experienced, haven't touched, haven't felt, haven't eaten. When this is all over, let's discover our land again with new eyes. Let's feel each other again. We are one people, 
brought together by destiny.